You can hear the rats rumming around in the cupboards. You wake up in the middle of the night to find cockroaches crawling across your bed. The faucet leaks. The door sticks. Water damage in the left leaves a hole in your ceiling through which you can see light from the apartment above. The toilet, well, let's just say it's not pretty. And the radiator keeps your 600 square feet feeling like a sauna in the wintertime, and the lackluster air conditioning keeps it just as toasty in the summertime. Oh, you've complained to the owner, and when he answers his phone, which is about once every two to three years, he just chuckles and reminds you that, hey, $3,500 a month for a studio apartment in New York is not a bad deal. And he's right. You're stuck. You see, for many New Yorkers, living in a dangerous and a disgusting apartment is a tough reality. With housing just not available and affordable rent non-existent, a good number of New Yorkers feel that they're at the mercy of a slumlord. That is, an owner who holds his tenants hostage with low rent, but doesn't provide in return any protection of their privacy or safety, and he doesn't maintain his facilities to any, any level of any modest standard of living. The problem has gotten so bad that the city of New York has set up a site to list the worst slumlords in the city. It's a website where people who feel that they have been bitten by rats can go and complain online. And if you're looking for an apartment, you can search out to see if that dream apartment that you're looking at will really turn out to be a roach-infested nightmare. But such problems are nothing new. Deep in the Gospel of Matthew, our Gospel lesson for today, Jesus offers a parable about what else? A rough relationship between tenants and the owner. However, in Jesus' parable, it's not the landlord who is bad, who, is not, who has violated the trust and cares little for his tenants. No, it's the other way around. It's the tenants who take advantage of the landlord's trust and generosity. For context of this parable, then, you have to remember that Jesus is just days away from his crucifixion. So, he's here in Jerusalem, and he's trying to clear away any doubt about his me message and ministry. He tells the people there that this parable, and by telling this parable that had really clear meaning, he sort of cranks up the heat. It's like he opens the door of the oven, cranks it up to 450 degrees, and lets the blistering heat fill in the air around him, bringing his ministry in Jerusalem to a rolling boil. The interpretation of this parable doesn't leave much to the imagination. Jesus isn't trying to hold or bide his time right now because his time had come. The landlord in this parable is obviously God. God had leased his vineyard, his kingdom, to Israel as laborers. And note the word Jesus uses there. He leases it. He doesn't give it to Israel. God always retains ownership. But the time had come for God to collect his fruit from the harvest. This vineyard that he set up, a vineyard that he put in fertile soil and watered it, to protect it from animals and thieves. He builds a wall around it and sets a watchtower. And the tenants, instead of tending the vineyard and producing a measurable crop for the owner, they decide to take it easy, to pamper themselves, 
and to ignore the vineyard. They sat on their hands and became complacent do-nothings. And as if that weren't bad enough, the warnings that God sent to them through the prophets, his agents, they decided to ignore and get rid of him. Enough is enough, says Jesus. The time has come for the vineyard to be taken away from those lousy, land, lousy tenants and given to a new people who would produce its fruit. God is no nasty landlord here. Many in Israel had become unfaithful, ungrateful, unfruitful tenants. The time for eviction had come. The time for new tenants, grace-filled, Messiah-followered, cross-focused tenants had arrived. And soon after Jesus told this parable, he was arrested. Go figure. But here's the thing. It's tempting for us, the new tenants in God's vineyard, to see this parable as a rebuke of the old guard. But that would be terribly short-sighted. Because if the landowner saw fit to include this parable in his written word, the Bible, then there's more to it than just reminiscing about the past. It's also instructive for the new tenants as well. To be sure, God won't kick out the church from the vineyard. The church is the kingdom of God. God didn't kick out the whole nation of Israel either. He kicked out those who refused to work in his vineyard. So if it's instructive that God was willing to evict his own chosen people, then surely God will evict those today who refuse to produce fruit, who having their names on the roll of the church is enough without laboring in his kingdom. This parable clearly teaches God's expectation for those who have been given the privilege to work in his kingdom, to produce fruit, to share the sweet wine of his vineyard with the world. Usually a parable has one intended meaning. And the one intended meaning of this parable is stewardship. And before you shut your mind down by saying, hearing the word stewardship, by going, oh no, here comes a sermon on money, let me remind you that stewardship is more than just money. Stewardship is, is what we do with God's stuff. And that includes every aspect of our life. There is no part of our life that isn't a part of stewardship once God brings us into his kingdom. And in this parable, there are really two aspects of life that Jesus wants us to focus on. One is recognizing what we've been entrusted with, and two, what we're to do with what we have been entrusted with. The first, with what are we entrusted? Scripture makes clear that you and I have been trusted with two big things that encompass our entire life. We've been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's right-hand realm in this world, and you and I have been trusted with our worldly personal goods, God's left-hand kingdom in this world. Both are from God and both are to be used in the kingdom of God. The gospel is the message that even though every human being has been rebellious against God, he still wants us to be his. He still wants to have a reconciled relationship with us. 
which is why he sent his son into the world. Because there on the cross, his son reconciled us to him so that now all lives, all people are welcomed into the vineyard to labor under God's love. In the same way, then, we are to recognize that all things, the clothes on our backs, the money in our wallet, the least ceiling over our heads, belong to God and are on loan from Him. King David said, Everything is the Lord's and all that is in it. We learn from the the explanation of the first article of the Apostles' Creed. I mean, we confess that we believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, my reason and all my senses, also clothing and shoes, meat and drink, house, home, wife, children, fields, cattle, and all my goods. God has given us everything. It's simply been leased to us. St. Paul says we brought nothing into this world and we will take nothing out of this world. We are renters of everything, owners of nothing. So, what should we do with what we have? Well, as you can see in this parable, it's not enough to simply recognize that we have been blessed with things and recognize who the owner is. Those jerk of tenants in this parable recognized that already, but that didn't make them followers of the owner. A good tenant, a solid steward, does something with what has been leased to them, those goods. He produces a crop. He makes use of the vineyard so that the sweet wine of the vineyard can bless the world. When was the last time you invited someone to church, God's vineyard? When was the last time you read the sweet rhyme of Scripture with your children? Have you matured to the point where you can pray for a co-worker and serve in the ministry here? If you were asked, could you defend your faith? What kind of crop? are you producing with the gospel? Likewise, how are you doing at managing God's material goods? Are you seeking to grow what God has given to you? Is there anyone who could share a story of how they were blessed with their, through their generosity, even though at the time they felt their own vineyard was sort of empty and bare? When was the last time some of your stuff, correction, God's stuff, blessed someone other than you and yours? Recently in the Village Voice, which is a New York magazine, they kind of turned the tables on this tenant-renter debate. And they said that for every bad owner or, or landlord out there, there are multiple bad tenants, you know, like the, the uh, party animal who can never play his music softly, or uh, the vandal who, who paints and puts holes in the walls and does his own remodeling without, any, without permission, or the one who always feels the need to have an extension on the extension on the extension of their rent. Uh, not to mention the disgusting lady who should be featured on the TV series about compulsive hoarding. There are slum lords, yes, but there are also slum tenants. Too many of us have been spiritual squatters. Living in a kingdom not ours and refusing to give God much of anything. And it's easy trap to slip into, especially when the landowner seems distant in a far-off country or seated somewhere in heaven, 
one begins to feel that that person just doesn't care. And then we begin to think that what we have, we can do with what we want. But we can't. And we mustn't. In Los Angeles, I, there was a Craigslisting posted. And, and I don't know if it's real or not, but I thought it was kind of funny. The uh, owner, instead of trying to tout the benefits of renting from him, seemed to be brutally honest about uh, what kind of apartment complex he ran. This is the listing that was put in Craigslist. It says, um, we take great pride in our inability to keep good tenants happy. Do you play, pay your rent on time? We'll, we will reward you by increasing it to the maximum allowable limit every year. Love hot water for your morning shower? Those luxuries aren't available here. All repairs will be made by unlicensed handymen. That leak that you have on your ceiling on sunny days, that's just the sewer leaking from the apartment above. We also like to snoop around your apartment every month or so under the guise of checking smoke alarms. Enjoy the beautiful pool, but only during the weekdays because on Saturday morning the gardener comes and uses his leaf blower to fill the pool with leaves and debris. It remains that way until the pool cleaner comes Monday about noon. Perfect for kids who don't yet have health problems. If we were to write an equally honest posting about ourselves as tenants of God's kingdom, as laborers in his vineyard, what would we say? Would we admit that we are at times incredibly ungrateful, terribly unfruitful? Would we confess that we, have, that we tend to live as though everything is ours to keep? No matter what you would write, the good news is this. Because of the work of Christ, he will be glad to have you as his and will freely give you whatever you need to be a productive worker in his kingdom. You and I have been given a lot. We are inhabitants, the new inhabitants of his vineyard. Life-giving wine flows within its walls because you and I have been given the gospel. So may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ keep your hearts in true faith to life everlasting. Amen.